Secretary Mattis came in, he met with the president, uh, they made the decision, and um, he won't leave for another couple of months. They have a good relationship. We expect them to continue to have a good relationship. The president has a great deal of respect for Secretary Mattis. He's going to stay on for another couple of months. I think that's a great indicator of the type of cooperation they have. Let's not forget, he's not just walking out the door. This will be an orderly process, and it will continue to be mm -hmm. a good relationship over these next couple Who's of months. Who's on the list? Well, of course, those comments didn't age very well. In a tweet yesterday, Donald Trump abruptly moved up the departure date of Defense Secretary Jim Mattis. Trump tweeted yesterday, I am pleased to announce that our very talented deputy Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan will assume the title of Acting Secretary of Defense starting January 1st, 2019. Now, senior Pentagon and administration officials tell NBC News that Mattis learned of his exit and learned that it was being moved up by two months in a phone call, not from the president, of course, because the guy that actually made your fired a catchword is terrified of confronting people in person. Uh, no, our Secretary of Defense learned from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo rather than the president himself that he'd be leaving on January 1st. On Thursday, Trump tweeted that Mattis would be retiring with distinction at the end of February, but the New York Times reports that, quote, Trump had not read Mattis's resignation letter, nor understood the stinging rebuke of him. The president grew increasingly angry as he watched a parade of defense analysts go on television to extol Mattis's bravery. Another aide said, until he decided on Sunday that he had enough. And then, of course, on Sunday, President Trump tweeted what appeared to be his response to Mattis's resignation letter. Quote, when President Obama ingloriously fired Jim Mattis, I gave him a second chance. Some thought I shouldn't. Actually, no, Mr. President. Everybody thought that was actually your best selection. Donald Trump went on to say, I thought I should. Interesting relationship. But I also gave all the resources that he never really had. Allies are very important, but not when they take advantage of you. The president wakes up at the White House this morning, not traveling to Mar-a-Lago for the holidays as planned because of his government shutdown. That government shutdown he claimed he would take credit for, and he is. Much more on that fight in a moment. But Trump has not been seen in public since Friday. And according to The New York Times, advisors say a furious president is cursing at AIDS while consumed by the multiplying investigations into his business, because that's what this is really about, his campaign and his administration. Reading from their report. For two years, Trump has waged war against his own government, convinced that people around him are fools, angry that they resist his wishes, uninterested in the details of their briefings. He becomes especially agitated when they tell him he doesn't have the power to do what he wants, which makes him suspicious that they are secretly undermining him. By all accounts, Trump's consumption of cable television has actually increased in recent months. That's not good for anybody. As his first scheduled meetings of the day have slid back from 9 or 9.30 a.m. to roughly 11 many mornings. During what's called, quote, executive time, Trump watches television in the residence for hours, reacting to what he sees on Fox News. While in the West Wing, he leaves it on during most meetings in the dining room off the Oval Office, one ear attuned to what's being said. Quote, can you believe this, he has said as he scanned the torrent of headlines. I'm doing great, but it's a war every day. Why is it like this, the president has asked his aides with no acknowledgement that he may actually be playing a role in this madness. So that's just part of where we find ourselves on this Christmas Eve morning, Monday, December 24th. Hope you're having a great Christmas Eve. I know I am. With us, we have historian, author of The Soul of America, and Rogers Professor of the Presidency at Vanderbilt University, John Meacham, columnist and associate editor for The Washington Post, David Ignatius. We have Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and associate editor for The Washington Post and MSNBC political analyst Eugene Robinson, Washington bureau chief for USA Today, Susan Page, and Republican communication strategist and MSNBC con political contributor Rick 
Tyler. So, um, David Ignatius, uh, let's um, let's keep score. I mean, this is not exactly the sort of show we could pre-tape for Christmas Eve in the middle of July. <laughs> Too much going on. Dude, so no, you couldn't I think really I'll plan this one. No, couldn't plan this one out. So I thank all of you so much for being with us this Christmas Eve morning. It certainly means a lot to us, and I know it means a lot to our viewers. So uh, there's a Washington Post article um, uh, entitled A Rogue Presidency um, that, that stated our, uh, where we are pretty well. The federal government is shut down. The stock markets are in free fall. Foreign uh, allies are alarmed. And foreign adversaries like Russia are cheering. So, David, where are we? Joe, we have used uh, language to try to explain to viewers the chaos, the disorientation of Washington, the sense of disruption to traditional policies so many times over the last 18 months. It may seem stale, but this week uh, we really experienced it. This week, Washington was rocked with decisions that shocked even close Trump supporters. After Secretary Mattis' uh, uh, resignation, I, I talked to a half dozen people who I describe as, as close. They keep their counsel about Trump, uh, and they just uh, shook their heads. I think for Republicans on Capitol Hill, this has been a week when they really worried about the, the, the course of this administration that they've tried to support. For our allies around the world, the, the kinds of things that you hear from them this week, what's happening to you? We're, we're worried, we're frightened about America's direction. Uh, I'll talk later a bit perhaps about my interview with the Syrian Kurdish commander who, who is going to take the brunt of President Trump's sudden decision to pull U.S. forces out of Syria. Uh, his language to me was heartbreaking. Uh, the, this was an America that he just didn't recognize. So. You know, this, this has been a week before Christmas that defied all of our, our previous uh, uh, concern and language. This, this one felt different to me. Words do seem to fail us, John Meacham, um, uh, because, again, uh, what I feared, uh, sometimes uh, we, we keep talking about rogue, the rogue presidency and we keep talking about it in dramatic terms, because so much that we're seeing we've never seen before. But in moments like these, words fail us. I, I, I want to read, um, I'm just getting into Andrew Roberts' uh, uh, Churchill, uh, which yeah. I have a feeling uh, I've just blown, uh, cr uh, blown uh, the surprise for about five of my, my, my relatives who probably bought, bought all of this, for, bought this for me for Christmas. Sorry, I already have it. Uh, but. At, 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 he has a quote of, of Churchill up front, uh, study history, study history. In history lie all the secrets of statecraft. And that was from May 27th, 1953. This is a man who um, saved civilization in the summer of 1940. He, of course, made terrible mistakes before and after, but he was prepared in 1940 for what came. And I would guess that uh, leaders like uh, General Mattis understand the same thing. But in Donald Trump, we have somebody who is averse to studying history, who has contempt for those who know about anything that go before them. We, we heard the Washington Post quote. He gets angry when people tell him that certain things he wants to do are against the law. This is a rogue president. And the question is, at this point, uh, what in the world uh, can Congress do, should Congress do? I think it's up to Congress. I also think it's up to all of us because the uh, far, far too often uh, the, what we see in Washington is enabled by the fact that Washington is more often a mirror of who we are than it is a molder of who we are. There's still a remarkable number of Americans who are willing to give the president a pass on these things that, as David was saying, have shaken the basic institutions uh, in, in a, if not unprecedented, in a scary way. 
Uh, I think the closest analogy to where we are is probably the second half of 1865, 66, 67, where we had a president who was simply not commensurate with the, the challenges of the office. Andrew Johnson had been put on the ticket to uh, bring along some border states. He was a Democrat. He was uh, a Tennessee unionist, but basically a, he was more wildly more sympathetic to the Southern cause than Lincoln was. And he was a kind of a man without a party. And there were threats of violence. There were questions about the war breaking out again after Appomattox and after Ford's theater. And Johnson would give wild speeches. Washington's birthday, uh, he gave this conspiracy minded speech saying things like, why is it like this? And why is this a war every day? So if you're in a, a paragraph where the only analogy anyone can come up with is Andrew Johnson, it's not a great holiday. If you're in, if you're in a historical uh, zone, and the other thing I'd say about Churchill is one of the last things we know he wrote, which was in the the uh, mid '50s, uh, in the history of the English-speaking peoples, he wrote, "The future is unknowable, but the past should give us hope," and that's something to cling to, uh, because these institutions, these American institutions, were built to confront and, God willing, survive moments like these. But those institutions only work if elected officials and all of us actually engage and think out what are the true limits to what we, as in the broadest sense of we the people, will accept. And, and, and that is a reason, Gene, I think, to be grateful this holiday season. Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, uh, this year has been about American institutions actually mm -hmm. proving that they are bigger than any man, bigger than any woman, and uh, that that Madisonian democracy uh, in 2018 is actually quite strong. But what do we do, Gene, when it does appear that this administration is terminal? Uh, this, this administration will not survive. Um, what do our leaders in Washington do? What do editorial page editors uh, do? What, what do people in news programs, uh, presidents of networks do? What does everybody do working together to make sure that this administration that is terminal uh, does not behave in a way that creates not only a governing crisis, but a, a pandemic, not only across this country, but across the world? Well, those institutions you talked about, Joe, are, are really going to have their work cut out for them in 2019. I mean, it, it, is, uh, it, it is incredible. Look, this, uh, I agree with you that this, we seem to have entered um, a, 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 you called it terminal, uh, it's an unacceptable zone, a kind of um, uh, end state of this administration where we have total chaos. The government is shut down. The markets are in free fall. Um, we have a Treasury Secretary, who who um, perhaps accidentally further destabilized the, the markets <laughs> over the weekend with with ill-advised phone calls to to the the heads of the major banks, saying, "Don't worry about anything." So, of course, everybody worries about everything. Oh, and, um, and, and by the way, not only Gene asking them to not worry about anything, but also going, "Hey, by the way, mm -hmm. are you liquid?" Yeah, right. If, right, yeah, if right. something went really badly when the markets opened up, are you mm -hmm. going to have enough money or are there going to be runs on your bank? No, yeah. don't yeah. do that from exclusive I exclusive resorts in from Mexico. Cabo. And uh, yeah, yeah. Not, not good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, not not good at all. And 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 it just brings to mind um, the the frankly abysmally low um, quality of, of, of a number of, of people in important positions in this administration. So, uh, you know, the, the thing that is, um, there are many things that are important about General Mattis's um, firing, um, but, uh, and, and David Ignatius is, is right that the, that the on-the-ground impact is going to be on the, on the, on the Kurds uh, in, in Syria, but, um, but, but the psychological impact is he was, the, he was seen as the, the sturdiest pair of guardrails we had uh, to keep this uh, uh, administration from going catastrophically uh, off track. 
and uh, and and with Mattis gone, it's hard to have that kind of confidence. And so we are we are reaching a point where we all have to wonder: Can we take two more years of this? Uh, and uh, and if we cannot, then what are we going to do about it? And um, it, that's the question that I, I, I think we're going to face in 2019. I, I, it, it is. It's a question I think, uh, Susan, that a lot of Republicans are facing right now. I'm sure you have noticed. I'm sure everybody uh, on the panel has noticed this weekend that an awful lot of Republicans that have bitten their tongues over the past two and a half years since Donald Trump won the nomination, uh, and, and quite a few supporters of his, apologists of his, have actually come out and started uh, being critical of, of Donald Trump over this past weekend. I have uh, somebody close to me <clears throat> who's been a Trump supporter for some time who on Twitter has publicly spent the weekend asking some tough questions. <clears throat> and that doesn't usually happen. And no, I'm not talking about Mika. Uh, but uh, Britt Brit, Brit Hume, I think, uh, noticed this as well. And he said, too much of the criticism of Trump has been overblown, too often about things that neither didn't happen or didn't matter. That is not true of the Syria Mattis uh, issue. This is a big deal, both in the substance of it uh, and Trump's decisions and the way the whole episode was handled. And it does seem that for many Trump uh, supporters, and uh, I'll say also, some Trump apologists. Uh, this was Trump crossing the Rubicon. This was, as, uh, as one historian said, this was basically the Jacksonians in the Trump coalition rising up and saying enough. You know, one of the surprises of the, of the past two years has been the willingness of top Republicans, including uh, congressional Republicans, to uh, accept President Trump's provocative rhetoric and some of his outrageous statements in the interest of policies that they supported. But I wonder if at this point we're going to see changes, especially in the Senate. Uh, with Republicans. We heard that from Pat Toomey yesterday on, on Meet the Press, a more critical tone. Uh, the other thing that's going to change as we go into this new year, of course, is Democratic control of the House, which gives the opportunity and, the, in fact, the inevitability of a kind of congressional oversight we haven't seen in the past two years. It's about to begin. And I wonder if President Trump's behavior over the last few weeks represents him kind of girding his base against two things that's going to happen, House with Democratic investigations and the Mueller report, which seems to be ready to come out perhaps in the next six weeks or so. Yeah, Rick Tyler, uh, we've been talking about Mattis, but the government is shut down. And I know as a, <laughs> I, I know as a former Republican legislator, I, you say the word shutdown. You know, Ted Cruz accused me in 2013 of, of, of having flashbacks and, and being too scared of government shutdowns. Uh, and I said, you're damn right, Ted. Uh, I have flashbacks and I'm scared of government shutdowns because that never ends well for Republicans. It never does. <clears throat> and here you have a party that saw the worst losses in the midterms just about a month, month and a half ago since Watergate. They lost about 350, 400 state legislative seats. They lost important governorships that are going to have a big say in redistricting and how this country is, is run over the next decade. And here they have a president who last week calls in Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, says, hey, I'm going to I'm going to shut down the government. I'm going to take credit for it. And then Mitch McConnell comes up with a deal that will get the president out of it. <clears throat> and he hears Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter get upset. And so he blows up the deal, not based on what Republicans want, not based on, you know, what conservatives want, not based on what anybody wants. But it's it's the talk radio uh, contingency. I, how loyal are Republicans, rank and file Republicans who have already seen their party just dropped over the past past month? How, how long are they going to going to hang on on this ride with this guy? Well, Joe, that, that remains to be seen. Um, it's been a little surprising. It's been two years. But let me, I think there is some hope in all this, in, in that if you look at uh, the presidency from a historic perspective, I, most of us on the panel now are, are currently sitting in an unoccupied city, except for Donald Trump, who's so isolated in the White House, 
um, by himself, and he continues to isolate himself. The reason I say there's hope is because the, the way this, this Constitution Republic is structured is uh, someone like, can you imagine if Donald Trump, given the force of his personality, was actually, actually able to make uh, the government work the way he wants to? And it doesn't work, and it's all dysfunctional now is because he doesn't understand how to make it work. The, the city doesn't operate by the force of persuasion. Uh, I'm sorry, the force of personality. It actually operates on the force of persuasion, and it starts with uh, giving the people a vision of where you want to take uh, this administration. What does it look like in four years, or in his case now in, in two years for his reelection? I have no, I couldn't begin to articulate what Donald Trump, where Donald Trump wants to bring us. And so he has not done uh, the hard work of convincing the American people that he deserves reelection. And that's why you saw what you just mentioned uh, in the last midterm elections, why the, the Democrats won so uh, decisively, uh, is because this presidency is in crisis. But again, I would say it, this, it is not designed to work this way. We, we have, we, we really have a government that's based on one word, and, and, and Republicans don't like to hear it. And sometimes Democrats don't either. But the word is compromise, and you have to work yep. with other people to because it's a shared power government. Thank God, and you have to work with people and work with American people to convince people of the direction you want to go. And if you don't, it devolves into dysfunction. And I think this is about as dysfunctional as as it gets. But I, I think we'll survive it too. Yeah, and we will. The Wall Street Journal this morning editorialized about the phony shutdown, talking about how Donald Trump's, quote, wall isn't what America needs. It's not going to stop people from getting into the United States of America. Uh, and, and also talked about uh, just the tyranny of small differences. They're, 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 this is just Donald Trump shutting down the government because a couple of people on talk radio told him not to take the deal that everybody agreed on. You know, we're going to uh, next block. We're going to get to David Ignatius' uh, uh, really important piece on the Kurds, uh, some of our most loyal allies over the past decade who uh, we're on the verge of abandoning again. But before we do that, John Meacham, I thought, you know, this is going to become a Christmas Eve tradition where parents are going to wake their children up on Christmas Eve <laughs> and they're going to all sit around uh, the Christmas tree if they have a Christmas tree and you're going to tell them yeah. stories that will promptly put them right back to sleep. So do you have any good historical Christmas Eve stories about, let's say, Millard Fillmore and Franklin Pierce uh, sharing eggnog? Any, any, anything that will bore us to death? See, you're going to regret this. You may already regret it. I do. Before we Go even ahead. get there, do you know Christmas Eve, 1929, the Oval Office caught on fire? Can you imagine really? under the administration? Yeah, the, can you imagine under the administration of Herbert Hoover a more appropriate metaphor? <laughs> so he is in the uh, state dining room in black tie, hosting a big dinner for the staff and the cabinet, the kids, the Marine Band, and the West Wing goes up in flames. There's an electrical fire, and so. It, being at one with the people, Herbert Hoover, in black tie with a cigar, goes over and watches the firemen try to save the Oval Office. So if you're looking for a metaphor for where the country was headed in the <laughs> end of the 1920s, into the 1930s, Herbert Hoover's Oval Office being set on fire is pr about as good as it can get. And That's if you want to go farther back, we'll just wait a few minutes and I'll come up with some things. Okay. But it really is. Yeah, yeah, thank it you really too. is, kids. <laughs> it's sugar plums meet C-SPAN. Here we go. Now, did, did um, uh, Hoover's wife run and go and cut a portrait out and save maybe a Carnegie or a Rockefeller portrait or anything like that, like Dolly Madison did in the I, War of 1812? I kind of like, like Mrs. Hoover in this. She actually wanted the band to keep playing. So it's like the oh, Titanic. Okay. I mean, they, they, So they kept okay. playing the Christmas carols to keep everybody happy while the West Wing is burning. It's, uh, and, and again, it's 1929. So again, how much, how much better could that be? Kids, it just couldn't be any better, John. Tuned. I know the kids are... The kids are so grateful for that story, <laughs> as are we. So, all right, stay tuned, kids. Still ahead on Morning Joe, we're officially in day three of the government shutdown. And not a creature is stirring on Capitol Hill because they're gone. We're going to have the very latest in what the Wall Street Journal's editorial board is calling the phony shutdown war. Plus, as we mentioned, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin assures America's bankers that everything's fine. The problem is... 
None of them were asking if anything was wrong. <laughs> Boy, I kind of freaked them out. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.